.NET 6 launched officially in, I think, November. And it had a whole ton of new stuff. A lot of it was really good stuff. And we did a launch party then to give, you know, to celebrate it overall. But we wanted to spend some special attention on just a few of the things that have come out uh, in it. And uh, one of the things that I wanted to talk about was the link extension, the new extensions to Link that came out. So I'm going to go over each one. There aren't that many, so it should be kind of a short meeting. But I'll go over each one, uh, what it does, and why the how the new extensions are. A lot of these are just additions to existing functions, so we don't have to spend a lot of time on them. And uh, I'll just talk about what those differences are versus the old ones. And I have examples for each one. So um, <clears throat> there are docs, and they, they call it APIs, extension API, or uh, link APIs. I don't know why they call it that, but don't be confused. They're just the extension methods we're going to talk about here. And as far as I know, that's all it is. So here's a link to the documentation. Uh, if you need that, you can look at the slideshows, or I can Slack it to you, or email, or whatever you need. Uh, but it's it's I just Googled it, what's new in .NET 6, and then I control F to find link. Easy enough. And now here is a list of the methods. So you can see there aren't that many. Uh, uh, over on the left, I point out that all of these are available on the enumerable types, and most of them are available on the queryable type. And, and I had typed that because they pointed it out that way. But as I'd gone through them, now that I've been through them all, I think the only one that's not on the queryable type is that first one, try get non-enumerated non count. So the rest, uh, th th that makes it easy to keep it straight in your head. You don't have to wonder, is it available or isn't it? <laughs> so uh, rather than read down these, we'll just go through them one at a time. But they are all in that list for reference if you want, uh, want to refer to it that way. Um, the first one, try get non-enumerated count. Um, I'm... I'll give it a little bit of background because I don't know how much everybody knows about link, but uh, there is a dot count method, and the dot count method will look at the underlying type and see if it knows how many uh, items it has in, in its collection. So if it's an i collection, it has a dot count property that it can just read, so it doesn't have to go and count the things itself. But if it doesn't have a, a known type with a known count in the, in, in the underlying implementation, it will go and get an enumerator and actually enumerate the collection to count the items. So this method is a way that you can uh, go and get that count, but if you don't want to enter, uh, enumerate the collection to get the count, this won't do it. It'll just give you the count if it knows what it is. If it doesn't know the count in the underlying type, this function will just return false, and its output parameter that normally would have the count will have a count of zero. So uh, let me... I want to do the examples here in LinkPad. And I have them over on my other screen pre-done so, so as not to waste time, but I'll try to build on them as I, I you know, um, so that we don't skip anything. So <clears throat> up here we have uh, just a, an I enumerable that doesn't have an underlying type that knows its count. And here we have a, an I enumerable with an underlying type that does know its count. So, uh, for those who are familiar with uh, LinkPad, you'll know that you'll know what the dump function does. But for those who don't, this dot dump extension method is provided by LinkPad, and it lets me take any value and visualize it in the output window. So when I run this, it's going to take uh, both of those collections, and it's going to run the the method in question, the try get non enumerated count, which is a mouthful. I apologize if I fumble over it here. I think you'll find the same if you try to say it out loud. Uh, I'll run that on each one. So this one's the known result knows what its count is, and the unknown result doesn't know. And then I'll just dump those as pairs. So when I press F5, no, it doesn't like something. I said I had these all done. Oh. Uh, there's nothing wrong with the code. I have to come up here, and if I had typed this out, it would automatically change this for me, but because I didn't, I have to come up here and tell it it's a program. And then I'll try it again. And so this is the visualization that I'm talking about, and it's super swell. I know it's probably too small. Oh good, I can scale that. I'm just gonna do some of this. And so it, it presents these little boxes as objects. And so you can see that when there's a list in the underlying implementation, 
it knows what the result is and it returns true and the out parameter is 10 and here's that out parameter that we're talking about just as you saw in the prototype on the slideshow and for a regular i enumerable which was produced by this iterator it doesn't know how many it has and so it returns false and outputs zero so if i want to know that count i'm going to have to go and do an action i'm going to have to go and do an actual dot count which is probably not what i wanted to do i'll do something else but in those instances where you don't want it that's how it'll behave next is chunk and chunk is interesting it it does just what you think, but it it may not it, it may be kind of hard to visualize what its output would look like. Uh, but Linkpad will do a good job of demonstrating that for us. It's going to take a single sequence, and it's going to break it up into subsequences inside of a sequence. So sp specifically, it's going to return an I enumerable whose types whose elements are type array. And so. Uh, we can specify the size of those of those chunks, and the last chunk is just going to have however many are left over. It's going to have, have the modulus for account. Um, the code for this is really simple. So in this code, I'm just going to make it a little bigger, a lot bigger. Uh, for those who don't know, enumerable.range, that just creates a sequence of values. In fact, I'll just... So you can see, so I can highlight that and press F5. And this is all it does. It creates an I enumerable with those values in it. So I'm going to use this throughout all my examples. And uh, I just want to make sure that everybody understands what that does. So uh, here in this example, I'm going to have this uh, sequence from 1 to 10. And then I'm going to call dot chunk with a size of 3 on it. And I assign it to output and then I dump output. So I'll just press F5 overall. And this is what it looks like. So I have an IU enumerable, and each of its elements are an int32 array. And that has three elements, three elements, and three elements because that's the size I specified. But because we had a 10 element array as our input, we end up with a single leftover. And so that last element has one element inside it. Pretty simple. Um, it, it might seem like this might be a good option for paging, and maybe it is, but there's another one that we'll want to look at a little later. Um, next is minby, and you may or may not have noticed that this is not the dot min that we have always had. This is minby. It's different. So I put in the notes here as opposed to min. Uh, I've tried to put the overloads in here, and actually let me go back here. Uh, on, on this slide, I've got, for my template here, I've got overloads and then I've got the overload spelled out here. But in all the others, I've also added this little tag that says it's available on iQueryable. So if you're looking at my slides, you can see that this guy doesn't have that. All the other guys do. So in, in case you want to just look at that and determine that from the slides. Uh, back to minby. The difference between min and minby is that min would, uh, it had certain overloads that would accept numeric types. But if you wanted to determine the minimum value of something that was not a numeric type, it, it, it wasn't convenient to do, and maybe you couldn't figure out how to do it at all. Minby will let you use a key selector. So for minby, I'll just grab my code here. Uh, I'm going to show you the old way that we had to do this. So I have some... I want this at least to fit on the screen. Okay, so I have a, a person class, and I'm going to use this throughout as well. It just has a string name and an int age on it, very simple. And uh, I'm going to use these, these arrays just to construct one uh, uh, three times. So Phil will have an age of 45, Nate will have an age of 40, Susan will have an age of 65. So I'm going to create a new person. It looks like this has some errors. Here we go, program, good. Okay, uh, this, this code up to this point is just going to create uh, three persons. And then I'm going to use an age comparer and pass it into min. So this is how you would have to do it if you wanted to do min on a non-numeric type. And it's, it's practical, it's fine, but you have to actually write a whole class here in order to, to do the comparison just to see if these two objects are the same. And that's not unusual. Java does the same thing. Other languages do the same thing. 
And we've been fine with it, but it can be better. So if I press F5 on this, uh, I wanted to do two, the youngest and the oldest, because I wanted to show that you can have different kinds of comparisons. Uh, so I have an age comparer that only compares on the type, or, or, sorry, on the, uh, the one property of person, which is age. But then I can go and do a min and a max with that same comparer. I can do, I, there are several other functions I can use with those comparers as well. So uh, there are two different ways that we can have flexibility here. The first is to have a different function that works with the same comparer, and the second is to have multiple comparers that work with a single function, or a combination of the two. Okay, so in our next example, uh, well, we have a, a min by and a max by. They're, they're on separate screens, but they are just one example because they both work the same way. Uh, distinct by has the same concept that's applied to the distinct method. So they're really not... Uh, stop that. A whole lot different. But let me pull up my distinct example. And it's only slightly different. Set to program. And I'll just run that. And I get uh, a single output which has uh, distinct names in it. But to get there, I have to create uh, a single data set that has some duplication in it. So I have two nates in this input and I have two people at age 40. So in here I have class person, but you see that this class person is not the same as it was before. All of this was class person in our previous example, but now I've got all this extra stuff over here. And so those who have been doing C-sharp since version one recognize this stuff. If you wanna to compare two objects in any way other than their reference, which means their internal address in memory, then you're going to have to implement one or two of these methods. And there's a get hash code and an equals. And uh, those are built into the .NET system.object type. So you use override, and those are available on every object in the system. So you can compare those using system-wide uh, uh, mechanisms. So once get hash code is implemented and equals is implemented, the distinct method knows what to do with them. But if you have uh, a person object that you want to compare in more than one way, how are you going to do that? Because you only get one get hash code method that you can override. You only get one equals method that you can override. And of course we can get tricksy and say, well, let's, let's have this do different behaviors based on conditions. And we can make those work, but you, you can imagine just how awful those get really quick. So it would be better if we could take a distinct that takes a comparer. And so... Uh, uh, even though this one runs and gives me a distinct uh, selection of this by name, so I'll only have a Phil, a Nate, and a Susan, we don't know which of those two Nates we got, but it doesn't matter because we just, we're just we distinct by name and that's what we get. If I want to improve on this, I can take this class per person that I had before, and you, you can ignore what this is, and you can certainly ignore this, it's not even used. But this is just a, a comparer that I, that I wrote, and it doesn't matter how it does it, it just matters that I have two different comparers, a name comparer and an age comparer, and the implementation of those is, is could be very simple. Uh, I just pasted some code here that would do the job so I didn't have to write it. Uh, now that I have this distinct, it has, uh, I, I have to confess, this is actually, uh, uh, I was working up, working on this up to the last minute. I had already written it once and then found I, I either didn't save it in the right place or I overwrote it with one of the others and the code was lost. So I apologize for that. The distinct example may not be very good. But uh, in this distinct overload, we can take two comparers and the comparers will work and I can get a comparison by name and a comparison by age. And you can see that these names are distinct, but they have duplicate ages. These ages are distinct, but they have duplicate names. So this does just what it should do. And I can do a third comparator that, com that is distinct by both name and age, but I, it, it's just messy code and it doesn't offer us anything really. 
Now, what I can do, let's see if I can even do this on the fly. Uh, with the new methods, and we all know better than this, you never do this during a presentation. But if I say distinct by, it's going to take, it's a teeny tiny text there, but it's going to take a key selector. So I can take a person and get and return their name. And I can take a person and return their age. And then I can do away with these comparers altogether and even the class that implements them. And what do you think, folks? Is that going to work? Oh, <laughs> lucky me. So once again, I have a distinct name on the first result and a distinct age on the second. And let's look at all the code that I no longer have to deal with. I'm not instantiating these things. I don't have to have uh, this big comparison class, which I only had one. If I were doing it the normal way, I'd probably have two of those. And all the implementation just lives right here. So that's a distinct improvement. Pardon the pun. All right. Accept by, same concept, but it applies to the accept uh, operation. And in the accept operation, Let's look at the old way. And in the old way, we have these these same functions, and not all of the the link the existing link function uh, uh, set type operations required both of these functions. I don't think, but some require one, some require the other, and some do require both. I don't really understand why, but I've tried them both ways, and they just don't work if they don't have them, and it doesn't make much sense. Once you go to the trouble of adding these to your type, you might as well add them both, and so. Uh, it, it looks just the same as all the others with these two methods on it. Now I have two data sets because the way the accept works is it'll, it'll return all of one data set, but it'll remove anything that exists in the second. And so in this case, I have two Nates. And so Nate shouldn't appear in my output. But of course, in data two, none, nothing in data two will ever show up in the output. So we also won't have a Susan. That leaves just Phil. And I'll F5 this, and of course we get just Phil. So we would like to try and improve this so that we don't have these guys here and then get the same output, which we can do. But except is just a little bit different than the others because, uh, because of the way it works and the way it has to compare things. It doesn't take two persons and then a person selector. It has to take a data set of not person, but name so that it can compare the result of this to the result of this. And so this dot select is is used in in the accept by but it's not used in some of the others uh, set uh, the other uh, set type operations. So this looks about the same but we have our compact version of person and uh, the accept by just takes these expressions right here to do its job and then we get fumble fingered sorry and then we get the same output. So that works. And that it, it's not a lot of code that we have to write for person, but it can be a real nuisance when your person is a generated class or if you have you know, dozens of these things, or especially if you want to do an accept on person by different criteria. Uh, there really isn't a, a reasonable way to do that with the, other, uh, with the old versions. You'd have to have a different comparison class for each one or use an anonymous class like I was using before, which is better, but still messy. This is much nicer. So I'm really liking these changes. Intersect by is the same concept, but I don't think I need to show you the old intersect. Uh, it looks pretty much like, the, you know, it, they're all the same at this point. But the new intersect by is, uh, uh, oh, this one also takes the dot select. So the way that this works, for those who, who aren't familiar with intersect, it'll take all of the items from data one that exist also in data two and nothing else. So in the Venn diagram, it's the overlap, right? 
So in this case, we'll get just Nate. He's the only one that's in both cases, in both sets. So it works pretty much the same as except, you just get different results at a different operation. Um, union is next, good. And it's going to take everything on the left plus everything on the right that is not going to be duplicated by the joint by the union of the two. So let's look at the old way. And in the old way, we have our familiar overrides in person. And this is exactly the same data that we had in the previous example, so nothing new there. And in the intersection, we get the Phil, the Nate, and the Susan, but we didn't get a second Nate because that's a duplication caused by the union. If there were two Nates in the first set, we would have two Nates, but because the union causes it, it won't show up there. Actually, I'm not sure that's true. If Nate's on, maybe he'll say. In fact, he doesn't have to say. I'm just going to find out. Nope, there won't be any dupes, so that makes it easy. Okay, so moving on to the new version of that. Union by simplifies our person class again. And in here, we don't have to specify that dot select because the way that it works is a little bit different internally. It doesn't have to have that projection in order to do the comparison. So if we look at the prototype in here, it says I enumerable of person for the second per, the second set. So it doesn't require it to be T key like the second one. And T key is going to turn out to be name of type string. So in this case, we have the same results. We have one of each. Okay. So first or default, this is not a new method like we've been looking at with the whatever by functions. First or default uh, just has new overloads. And so these overloads uh, allow you to specify a value other than the type's default value as the value that will be returned if there's not a match. So I'm going to take an opportunity to uh, spell out a pet peeve I have. Not because I want to whine about it, but because I think it's important for the discussion I had. Uh, I frequently see uh, give me a second here. I have a uh, first word of fault here. I'm going to just hi uh, comment this out real quick. I frequently see people doing this. And I know everyone, everyone on the horn has done this before. You've all done it, you've all seen it. And I guess generally it, it, it's not the worst thing, but you can take these out and use just first or default and pass it the filter right here. And that, that has the possibility that it can shortcut the operation and not have to iterate the entire uh, uh, data source before it gets to the dot first or default. Generally, you're dealing with uh, an expression tree and hopefully your expression tree goes against something like SQL Server that might be, the provider might be smart enough to optimize that so it's just a single operation. But I never know if that's gonna happen unless I actually look at the SQL and take the time. It's just easier to not deal with it. Just use dot first or default and, and know that it's gonna have the potential to be better. So with that out of the way, uh, I point that out because some folks probably didn't know that first or default takes a predicate. In this case, it takes a predicate and we're going to, uh, we're going to get a default value if no matches on that predicate are found in the source. The default value for that, if I highlight over this and you, it's too small for you to see, but the return type and hence the uh, T Per, uh, parameter type for first or default in this case is int. So the first name 
is going to be of type int. So I, I can technically go like that and it's and it would compile if I were compiling this. But because that's an int, the only value I will ever get back from first or default when there's no match is zero. And so the new version changes that. So here's the old way, and I would just have to check to see if the first name is the default because int is not a nullable type and int is not a reference type. So I don't know if it found it or if it didn't find it and returned the same value because they happen to be the same value. So uh, this, this check is re a really terrible way to code this. You probably want to do something like a dot any before you do a dot first or default. And uh, that's kind of silly. Um, a better way to do that would be uh, dot single because you want to ensure that there's one there. Um, but then it throws an exception if there's not. You have to you know decide which one to use. But uh, in this case, if I just want uh, 100, uh, if it's not found, then I can use the new overload. And I had, I had a hard time coming up with an example for this because for reference types, it almost doesn't make much difference. But uh, I should have two of these open. Let me just move this other one open to over. So you can see them side by side. Okay, so in the old one here, I have a dot first or default on the int type, but I also have one up here that's a reference type, it's an object, and that's dealing with a person. So if I have a first or default that isn't uh, that doesn't find any matches on its predicate, I'm gonna it's gonna return null, and I'm going to have to deal with that. So the easiest way is to use a null coalesce, coalescing operator, and just return something. But in this case, I return a new person, and that's probably not the way I would do it in the real world. I'd write something imperative to deal with that. But uh, in the new code, I can instead just put the new person as the last parameter. And you can see that syntactically, that doesn't really buy me much. I got three lines here and I got three lines here. So I don't know that one is so much more readable than the other as far as reference types go. But if you're dealing with something uh, other than a reference type, I think it makes a much bigger difference because this code is much better than all of this nonsense. Plus, this nonsense really doesn't work. So... Uh, we're just talking about this third parameter that pops up and it's the parameter declaration just says string default value. So I can put anything in there that I want as long as it's the matching type. Okay. Uh, I'm gonna get this one out of here. There we go. Okay, last or default. Uh, I'm not even going to bother with that. It does the same thing. Uh, it just picks a different element out of the uh, source, but has the same behaviors, same uh, parameters, and same purpose. Single or default, same thing. Um, I, actually, I don't have examples for that anyway, so it doesn't matter. <laughs> um, I didn't point this out either, but where, I, where I've where i noted that these are also available on iQueryable, uh, you would surmise then correctly that these overloads that I put in here are just the IEnumerable overloads. So you would have an equivalent overload for the iQueryable. Um, uh, min and max. Uh, these are not new functions either. They have uh, new overloads that allow you to specify a comparer. And so they have the same problem that... Uh, some of the other uh, functions have, where you, uh, if you're relying on the overloads that you put in the class, you only have one way to compare these things unless you get creative. And so, in here, let's have a look at what that looks like. I don't have 
the old way specified or uh, demonstrated here, but that's fine. So the the comparer classes, I didn't use the anonymous one this time, I just came up with one uh, for age. Uh, and this is equivalent to the min and max example I did at the very beginning. So it now takes a comparer parameter and I can create an instance of any comparer that I want and I can compare a person in any way I want, by name, by age, by something else. I added birthday money on here because I was doing something else, but we're not using that. So uh, when I use that comparer for age, I can use it with the min and the max and compare the same object in two different ways. Uh, this was working a moment ago. In fact, it works on my other instance. Must make it a... I don't know what I did wrong there. Okay, so just as you would expect, the minimum age was 40 and the maximum age was 65, uh, according to the data. So no surprises there. Easy peasy. Take. Uh, this one's interesting. So for those who use link, you'll know that skip and take are often used as, as a pair. And uh, if you're not dealing with deferred execution, they'll iterate twice. Usually you're using deferred execution, so it's not usually a big deal. But take just became very interesting because now it accepts a range parameter. So in my take example, which is uh, probably more complicated than I really want it to be. <laughs> Kidding. So I can take uh, either of these expressions and I, I just create a range of one to 10 and then I do a dot take and in in this syntax, which is new in .NET 8, this is called a range literal syntax, and it specifies that I want uh, a, it. I think I'd just like to cover that real quick because I bet folks aren't familiar with it. So if I take this range and I dump it, I have one through ten. Now, if I have a dot two array, I get the same uh, the same thing. And then on that dot two array, I can say uh, I can I can index it here, and I can say two dot dot seven, and it's going to say give me um, everything from two to seven. Uh, not include or uh, not inclusive on the first one. So if I take this, I, I just want to dump that seven, and I dump that. You can see that this is a literal representation of what's called a range, and a range has a start and an end, and I can stick values in here. And then anything that accepts a range that wants a start and an end will accept this syntax. And it's the same thing with this one down here, except that this means relative to the end of the set. So I hope that's clear. But it just means that I'm going to go from uh, items 2 through 7 in my take. So my take will skip 2 and then take up to 7. And this one will just take the last three, starting from the beginning until three from the end. So eight, nine, and ten are missing. So take now, if you give it a range, can kind of do a skip and a take. Uh, I don't know that this is as readable as a skip and a take, but I a skip and a take can't really do this without a count. And um, I don't really understand for sure how take is going to deal with a count if it doesn't have an underlying type that knows its count. So maybe it doesn't make any difference as far as whether you're using skip and take or just take with uh, 
the, the hat operator here relative to the end. But this one, if you're doing this, I think is much more readable, much more succinct, and kind of cool. So uh, use it or not, that probably depends on the situation as far as readability goes. Functionality probably doesn't make any difference. And that brings us to our last one, which is .zip. And .zip is, I wish I, uh, I wish I had an old one to show, but let's talk about what it does here. It produces a sequence of tuples with elements from three specified sequences. And if you, if you don't know what zip does, uh, it's probably better to demonstrate it. So I will just do that. I'll say, um, Um. Okay, so I have these two sets. There's the alphabet and the numbers, and they're they they could be arrays or they could be enumerable. Uh, doesn't matter. But what .zip will do is I can say alpha .zip, and then I can give it a second se uh, uh, sequence, which is going to be numeric, and then I can give it uh, a result selector. So I might say new. I can't do that. I got to say, um, I thought I had to specify the first. I do. Okay. So alpha and numeric. I'm going to return left is alpha. Sorry, A. And right is misspelled. I'm just going to take these out and muddy up the waters. Okay. So it just takes those two and lines them up side by side and sticks them together. So that's what zip does. But I don't have to use a new, you know, this is a projection. I don't have to use an anonymous class here. I could use a tuple or I could use some other class or I could use a, t, uh, a key value pair. Or I could do something more exotic. Maybe I make a new person from it. I actually, I actually could do that. Uh, I have the right types and the right number. But uh, this new version, which takes three, I'm just going to create a new window here and add the new version. And that... Re Oh, this is the right one. Uh, that really is actually the purpose of the new overloads is just to add a third sequence. So when I run this, I would get uh, all three sequences side by side. And then just for fun, I take that first line and I dump that. So that's what this tuple, this second box is. And then I deconstruct that tuple and I get those three values out of it and I just dump those one at a time just so you can kind of see a little better what those how those are constructed but this third this three sequence zip i'm not sure i've ever had a use for it maybe i have but i didn't know it because it didn't exist but one thing that i noticed right away is that when you zip with these three sequences there is no overload that lets you specify a projection none at all so here's it only shows me three overloads and one of them does say result selector, but it doesn't take a third sequence. So it doesn't apply. So if you're going to use three sequences, you're not going to get a projection. You're just going to get a tuple. And it's it doesn't spell it out quite like that, but it does say it'll give you a tuple. And that's fine. Tuples are so great in since, what, version 8 or 9? Whenever they made them first-class citizens, they're just outstanding. I have no problem with working with tuples and not getting projection because I can go and do whatever I want with it after the fact. Okay, so I think, yep, that's my last slide. Then I want to thank you all for coming. Uh, it's one of our shorter meetings. Uh, uh, Nate, do you have anything? Thanks, guys. Have a good night. Thank you.